All right, so we're diving into a real classic today. A chilling one. You got that right. The Fall of the House of Usher Edgar Allan Poe. Yeah, a masterpiece of gothic horror, wouldn't you say? Absolutely. So whether you're revisiting this tale or just encountering it for the first time. Getting ready for that big test, maybe. Maybe. Well, we're going to unpack what makes this story tick. Uncover those hidden layers that keep readers coming back for more, even today. Exactly. And I think one of the first things that hits you is just how... Oh, the atmosphere, right? Yeah, the atmosphere. It's so vivid, so oppressive. Poe just throws you right into this world of dread. From the very first sentence. During the whole of a dull, dark, and soundless day. It's like, bam, instant chills. Right. Those words are so carefully chosen, you can just feel the gloom the decay. Like something bad is about to happen. Impending doom, for sure. And it's not just the setting, right? Mm -hmm. Our narrator is, well, he's not having a good time. Not at all. He's drawn to the House of Usher, but he's also terrified of it. It's like this weird push and pull. And that really gets at one of the big themes Poe is exploring here. The struggle between reason and superstition. Oh, I like that. Yeah, the narrator is constantly questioning his own perception. Like, is this real? Am I going crazy? Exactly. Which, of course, just makes the whole story even more unsettling. Now, before we even meet the ushers, Poe throws in this epigraph. A quote in French, no less. Right. From Pierre Jean de Beranger. It says, <laughs> His heart is a suspended lute. As soon as it is touched, it resounds. Okay, so what's the deal with that? What's Poe trying to tell us? Well, it's not just a fancy poetic flourish, that's for sure. Okay, good, because I was worried about that. This quote actually foreshadows what we're going to see with Roderick Usher. The master of the house. Right, Roderick. He and the house itself are intensely connected. They're both incredibly fragile. Like that loot? One touch in. And everything could fall apart. Whoa, okay. I'm starting to get the chills again. Good. It means Poe is doing his job. So we've got this creepy house. A narrator who's already on edge. Mm. And then we finally meet Roderick Usher himself. Talk about a portrait of decay. I know, right? Poe doesn't hold back on the details. Mm. He's pale, emaciated, almost ghost-like. And it's not a coincidence that he looks like he's mirroring the house, you know? Oh, you mean like as the house decays, so does Roderick. Exactly. It's like there's this symbolic link between man and his environment. Mm. Interesting. Roderick's illness isn't just physical, it's like he's being consumed by the house itself. Okay, that's creepy. Right. And to make matters even weirder, Roderick is an artist. He paints, he composes music. But his art is kind of disturbing, right? Yeah, his creations seem to reflect his troubled soul. Especially that poem, The Haunted Palace. Right, it's like a metaphor for Roderick's own crumbling mental state. The palace is beautiful. But it's been taken over by these evil things. Filled with discordant melody. Which mirrors Roderick's own mental decline. And you know, Poe actually set that poem to music himself. Yeah, so it's like we're getting this musical glimpse into Roderick's mind. A troubled mind, for sure. Speaking of troubled minds, we need to talk about Madeline Usher. His twin sister. Right. She is just shrouded in mystery. With that strange illness of hers. And then she appears to die. But are we ever really sure what happened to her? That's the thing. Poe leaves us guessing. And that's what makes it so scary, right? Exactly. That ambiguity, that blurring of the line between life and death. It just adds to the overall feeling of unease. And we can't forget that weird connection between Roderick and Madeline, right? Sympathies of a scarcely intelligible nature, as Poe puts it. Like their bond goes beyond just being twins. Almost supernatural. For sure. <laughs> So we've got this creepy house, a narrator who's losing it, and these twins with a mysterious bond and some potentially very serious health issues. Where do we go from here? Well, Roderick decides to entomb Madeline. In the house. Yeah, in a vault inside the house. No, that's not good. It's a decision driven by fear, superstition. And that weird connection they have, right? Exactly. It's like he's just inviting disaster. Sealing his sister in a tomb. In a house that's already falling apart. You can really feel the tension building at this point. Like something truly horrific is about to happen. And this act of entombing Madeline, it has multiple layers, you know? Okay, I'm listening. On one hand, it's Roderick retreating from the world. Hiding away in this isolated, decaying world. Right. 
But it also suggests this... Oh, this possessive attachment he has to Madeline. Yeah, like a love that's cost a line. Okay, that's definitely creepy. And then things get even more intense. The storm hits. A raging storm. We hear all these crazy sounds coming from inside the house. Roderick confesses. And then Madeline. Oh, Madeline returns. It's pure Poe. The master at work, right? So the storm outside. It mirrors the inner turmoil going on inside the house, inside Roderick's mind. And the sounds. Remember, the narrator is reading that creepy story, The Mad Tryst. Out loud. Yeah, and every time he reads a passage about something happening... There's a corresponding sound from within the house. It's like reality and imagination are totally blurred. Like, are we losing our minds? Mm -hmm. Is something supernatural actually happening? Well, it, it's such a brilliant way to build suspense. To make you question what's real. What's just in the narrator's head. Or even Roderick's. Exactly! And then there's that moment where Roderick confesses. Oh, yeah. He thinks he buried Madeline alive. You can just feel the weight of his guilt. His fear. Pouring out of him. And the way he describes hearing Madeline struggle. Trapped in the coffin. It's like he's brought his worst nightmare to life. And then boom, Madeline appears. As if she was summoned by his confession. Talk about a gothic climax. Please, Madeline's return embodies all of Roderick's fears. Okay, but what does it all mean? What's Poe trying to tell us with this story? Well, there are a lot of layers of interpretation. Oh, I bet. On one level, it's about the fall of the Usher family. Literally and figuratively. Right. They're this decaying lineage haunted by their past. Destroyed by their own weaknesses. And the house itself, it's like a symbol of their decline, right? Exactly. As the house crumbles, so do the ushers. The house of Usher isn't just about the physical structure. It represents the whole family line. Their legacy. Their legacy, yeah. So as the house decays and collapses. So does the Usher lineage. Wow, that's pretty powerful. It's like a warning about isolation, the dangers of a family becoming too introspective. Too cut off from the world. Right. And we can't talk about this story without mentioning the setting. Oh yeah, that incredibly oppressive atmosphere. It's like the house is a character itself. Influencing everything that happens. It really seeps into your bones as you read. It's more than just a backdrop. It's shaping the character's destinies. Is Poe suggesting that our environment can actually make us who we are? Ooh, that's a great question. And one that Poe seems to be grappling with here. Okay, tell me more. He's using this literary device called pathetic fallacy. Pathetic fallacy. Yeah, where the environment mirrors the character's emotions, their mental states. So like the gloomy atmosphere, the decaying house, the dark tarn. They're not just there to be spooky. They're reflecting the inner turmoil of the Usher family. Exactly. It's like when you listen to sad music and it makes you feel sad. The music is reflecting your mood. Right. And the house is reflecting the Usher state of decay. Wow, that's really cool. I know, right? And then there's that final scene. Oh, so powerful. The house collapsing into the tarn. It's like the complete annihilation of the Usher family. Gone. Just like that. Everything swallowed up by those dark waters. Leaving nothing but silence. Emptiness. All traces of the ushers, their history, their secrets. Gone. It's a heavy image. But Poe doesn't stop there. Oh, no. He also delves into some fascinating psychological aspects of the story. Especially with Roderick Usher. It's like Poe is really getting inside Roderick's head. Showing us just how sensitive he is. Like super sensitive. To everything. Right. Foods, fabrics, sounds. It's like the world is just too much for him. Yeah, like his senses are on overdrive. So everything becomes an assault. This idea of sensory overload. Oh, I've heard of that. Yeah, it was becoming a big thing in the 19th century. Really? Yeah, doctors were starting to recognize it as a symptom of mental distress. Like people's nervous systems were just too sensitive. Exactly. They were overwhelmed by everyday life. And Poe, he was fascinated by the human mind, right? Totally. So he might be tapping into this new understanding of mental illness. Showing us Roderick's mind on the brink. Unable to cope with the intensity of the world. This whole idea of the house influencing the family, though. Yeah. It's fascinating. I know, right? Like, is Poe saying that our environment can literally change who we are? Hmm, good question. Or is there something more to the House of Usher? Something beyond just bricks and mortar? Is the House of Usher just this creepy old mansion? Or is it a reflection of the Usher family's minds? Remember how Roderick says he thinks the house is alive? Yeah, like it has some kind of influence over him and Madeline. He talks about the atmosphere of the house and the tarn. Like it's this tangible force. Shaping the destiny of the family. For generations. Right. So is the house just a setting? Or is it an extension of their minds? Like a manifestation of their inner darkness? 
their anxieties, their fears. Okay, yeah, I can see that. And when the house finally collapses. It all comes crashing down. All that darkness is released. Consuming everything. It's a powerful image, for sure. It really makes you think. Right. Is the House of Usher just a physical place? Or is it a symbol of the human mind? Our capacity for darkness, for decay. What terrors are hidden inside our own minds? That's what Poe does so well. He leaves us with these unsettling questions. Makes us confront the dark side of human nature. The power of our own imaginations. He doesn't give us any easy answers. Instead, he invites us to explore those shadowy corners of our minds. Oh, there you have it. Our deep dive into the fall of the House of Usher. A chilling tale indeed. Hopefully you've gained some new insights. Into this classic work of gothic horror. The themes of decay. The human psyche. And the power of setting. And who knows, maybe you'll see the world a little differently now. Question the spaces we inhabit. Are they just spaces? Or something more. Something that reflects who we are. Until next time. Keep exploring.